But what we're going to start talking about in this series on witnessing, first of all, is a chapter from Patriarchs and Prophets called The Schools of the Prophets. And I believe that this uh, chapter will help lay some foundational groundwork for us on issues of education, issues of how to uh, be properly trained and what needs to happen that we can be properly trained for service for God. This is chapter 58 of Ellen G. White's book, Patriarchs and Prophets. And so if you have a copy of that book, I would encourage you to read that chapter, not just simply tonight, but maybe for next week and possibly the week on. I don't think we can cover all this in even two sessions, although we can see where we get at with it. But um, in this, in these slides, I have uh, the different paragraphs, some of them broken up into two or th three slides to get them to fit on without being so small. So if you don't have a copy and you have internet access, you'll be able to see it. If you're just on the phone, you can see it. But if you have a copy at home, then I encourage you to um, to get your own copy out. You might want to mark it, underline it, or just make notes as you go along. I, I provide you guys a copy tonight because I failed to tell you that we were doing this tonight. You might have wanted to brought your own instead. But uh, feel free to use one of the two copies that I brought in tonight for you guys. But I'm going to begin uh, with the very first uh, paragraph here. It starts on page 592 of the Standard Edition. And so I'm going to be reading these paragraphs and making comments on paragraphs. We'll be adding some scriptures to it. We'll be looking at a few other spirit of prophecy quotations that concern the, the issues that we're talking about. And I believe that this material is worthy of some of our most careful uh, study, some of our most careful research. So I encourage you to, to listen carefully. It says, The Lord himself directed the education of Israel. His care was not restricted to their religious interests. Whatever affected their mental or physical well-being was also the subject of divine providence and came within the sphere of divine law. And you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we do a lot of health, a lot of medical missionary work. And sometimes we refer to this work as a holistic kind of work. We don't just treat one phase or one aspect of, of the human being. We try to treat the whole person, whether he has uh, mental health, physical health issues, emotional, and of course, above all, spiritual health issues. We want to take care of those. And I also think of a statement that Ellen White makes in Steps to Christ, where she says that there's nothing uh, too small that if it affects our happiness, that, that God doesn't take notice of, right? And so God is interested in everything about us, and uh, he wants to, to help us in our education to understand how he views the big picture, and so that we can also view the big picture as well. Continuing to the next paragraph, it says, God had commanded the Hebrews to teach their children his requirements, not options, requirements, and to make them acquainted with all the dealings with their fathers. This was one of the special duties of every parent, one that was not to be neglected to another. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of the father and mother were to give instruction to their children. So Ellen White is speaking here about the need that we have as parents, if we have children, to instruct them personally concerning his requirements, the things that are of a religious nature. Now, Ellen White is not saying that every parent has to train every child in every subject that they have. Uh, she spoke of church schools and alternatives for certain things. We, we know there's reading, writing, and arithmetic that need to be done, and although those things are not becoming as, um, as important to some people as they used to be, I think most of us would still value those uh, principles of education. But concerning the, the spiritual requirements that God has of his children, this is a, an important duty to the parents, and she says it should not be delegated to another. And when we look in our country today, in America, for example, and we see there that we have at least half of our children growing up today in single-parent homes, there is so much pressure and so much stress upon our young people. And for parents, you know, and, and we need plural, we need parents in a home. It becomes hard for that single parent to try to be the breadwinner, to take care of so many things, and yet also gives the most important thing that they can have is uh, spiritual instruction. 
And she says this should not be delegated to others. Very plain about that. Continuing that same, or just before we go to, the, to, to that next part in that uh, paragraph, I do want to look at this text in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, we have what we call the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. But sometimes we, we don't uh, share the, the verses that come right after that. And he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And, uh, and then he says, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And so God expects the parents to train the children in all phases of life, in every aspect of their life. They are to train them when they go in, when they come out, when they lie down, when they rise up. All of these aspects are to be dealt with. Now, continuing in that second paragraph in Patriarchs and Prophets, on, on the first page, it says, Thoughts of God were to be associated with the events of daily life. The mighty works of God and the deliverance of His people and the promises of the Redeemer to come were to be often recounted in the homes of Israel. And the use of figures and symbols caused the lessons given to be more firmly fixed in the memory. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed on the young mind. It was trained to see God alike in the scenes of nature and the words of revelation. And so the children were taught about nature and revelation, both alike testifying of God's love and his goodness for them and his love in wanting to see them redeemed from sin. Continuing in the rest of that paragraph, notice it says, The stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the rippling, rippling brooks, all spoke of the Creator. The solemn service of sacrifice and worship at the sanctuary and the utterance of the prophets were a revelation of God. Now here again, she's mentioning two things. She's speaking about revelation and nature. And in this first part about nature, the stars of heaven. You know, friends, if we live in, in, in these large cities that have so much pollution in them, and one of the pollutions they have is called light pollution. I don't know if you've ever heard that term or not. But in a, in a city where there are a lot of lights, uh, people who like to stargaze will call that light pollution because it keeps your eyes from being able to see the heavens, you see. But she speaks about the stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the rippling brooks. Friends, if we are in those cities and we never get to go see those things in person, we need to see them in person. We need to experience those kind of things in person to really understand the God of nature. I had an interesting experience a little bit ago, and here's a picture of my daughter Heidi and myself. And in this picture, I'm actually wearing her helicopter helmet. My daughter works as a flight medic for one of the helicopter services called HealthNet that takes people to emergency services who are critically ill or who have been critically injured. And, and, and this picture looks a little strange because my eyes are glowing, but of course it's really not my eyes. I'm wearing her night vision goggles, and I'll show you guys the photo later if you haven't seen it. It's pretty interesting. But with these night vision goggles, everything becomes a little uh, monochromic. You, you can't see much color. You just see green and blacks, but you can see everything. Even in what seems to be almost total darkness, you can see in great detail uh, things. And, and she says, Dad, there's not been a night one that I've been flying that I haven't seen shooting stars. Hmm. Now, normally, we look hard and long to see one shooting star. But she says, I see them every night. They're there all the time. We just can't see them easily. But with these glasses, I can see them. And she says, and when I, I look up and I see the Milky Way at night, it is so, so clear and so distinct you know, and so many of these things are there and we just don't have our minds and our eyes attuned to them. And so we need to be in the country, friends, all that we can. And we need to ask God to show us wonderful things from nature as well as from his law. And so Ellen White speaks about these, these great facets of nature and how they and Revelation alike teach us about the God of love. Now, continuing in Patriarchs and Prophets, I'm on page uh, 592 now, paragraph 3, the third beginning paragraph of Patriarchs and Prophets, 592. And we're reading again through the chapter, The Schools of the Prophets, and having some discussion, commentary, and uh, insight on it. It says, Such was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen. 
of Samuel by the faithful Hannah, of David in the hill dwelling at Bethlehem, of Daniel before the scenes of the captivity, excuse me, of Daniel before the scenes of the captivity separated him from the home of his fathers. Such too was the early life of Christ at Nazareth, such the training by which the child Timothy learned from the lips of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice the truths of Holy Writ. And that's making reference to 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 3.15. Now notice here that um, Ellen White mentions the grandmother Lois as well as the mother Eunice. And uh, Timothy's father was a Greek. He apparently wasn't a Jew. He wasn't interested in spiritual things like uh, Lois and Eunice were. And in those days... You, you didn't really have too many of those older people living alone. They would, after a time, they would go and live with their children. It was what you needed to do because there were no nursing homes, no other way to take care of yourselves. But these people were valuable instruments in helping the young to learn. And, uh, and Timothy had much to thank his grandmother Lois for as well. Continuing in the next paragraph, it says, Further provision. So there was a provision made where the parents and the, at least the grandparents, were to train their children in spiritual things. But now it says further provision was made for the instruction of the young by the establishment of the schools of the prophets. If a youth desired to search deeper, see this is that further provision, deeper into the truths of the word of God and to seek wisdom from above that he might become a teacher in Israel, these schools were open to him. Continuing, the schools of the prophets were founded by Samuel, to serve as a barrier against the widespread corruption, to provide for the moral and spiritual welfare of the youth, and to promote the future prosperity of the nation by furnishing it with men qualified to act in the fear of God as leaders and counselors. The main function of the school of the prophet was to prepare men to be leaders of God. I remember, and this has been probably 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago, I saw in the Advent Review an advertisement from Southwestern College. And in this advertisement, they had a, um, it was all about how you could come to their school and get a degree in being an entrepreneur. How you could be an entrepreneur. And of course, most entrepreneurs are interested in making money. And, uh, and I thought, you know, how contrary how contrary to the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ teaches us unselfishness. It teaches us service. Not what we can get, but what we can give. And friends, this is the kind of education that we need to give our people today. The kind of education our youth need. And there is a place, there's a place for people to learn sciences, higher sciences, physics, calculus, differential equations. Sure, those things have their place. We need people who can do that. But the majority of God's people, friends, what they need to know is how to serve God and how to train other people, how to teach others about the God that they serve. And so their idea was to promote the future prosperity of the nation, says, by furnishing it with qualified men to act in the fear of God, and they would be leaders and counselors. In the accomplishment of this object, Samuel gathered companies of young men who were now notice, pious, intelligent, and studious. These were called the sons of the prophets. As they communed with God and studied his word and his works, wisdom from above was added to their natural endowments. Now there are three things. Pious, the piousness, the um, intel intelligence, and the studiousness. Certainly there's a certain amount of intelligence that is needed for certain uh, certain roles that God has in, amongst his people. But God's not asking us all to be Einsteins. He's not asking us all to have uh, this, this kind of great ability. Because notice at the end of the paragraph, or the end of this section, it says, wisdom from above was added to their natural endowments. What God really needed more than anything else was, he needed a willing heart from people who would live piously, and they would be studious. They would study hard. They would work hard at what they were trying to do. You know, friends, God, I, I have to tell you, God has no place in his work for lazy people. If we are not go-getters, he can't use us like he wants to. That's for sure. Maybe not at all. But 
uh, you know, the, 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 in the Proverbs, he says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, and be wise, and learn of her. And so we need to understand that if we have a desire to be righteous and holy, if we will be studious and apply ourselves, God can supply the intellect that we need absolutely for sure. Now, in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, it says, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And so this, these things that we read about, that God was willing to do for those young men who entered into the schools of the prophets, he's willing to do for us today. He wants to do for us because he's no respecter of persons. And that's an interesting phrase, persons, because he just didn't say men alone. Now, while it's true the schools of the prophets might have been for the men folk, God is wanting to use both men and women today. He wants to use them to help other people to know the truth and, and to become Christians. Notice the statement from the Review and Herald of January 25, 1912, paragraph 3. That's RH 125.12, paragraph 3. It says, wise teachers, men and women, who are adept in teaching the truths of the word, are needed in our cities. Let these present the truth in all its sacred dignity and with sanctified simplicity. And this is a work in which many can fit themselves to have a part. Let all our people, you know she doesn't say just some, let all our people, young and old and the middle-aged, Ministers and lay members be quick to grasp opportunities to, for obtaining an experience in the work of making known to others the truths of the word. And that, again, that's from Review and Herald of 125, 1912, paragraph 3. So she speaks about both men and women. She speaks about the young. She speaks about the old. She speaks about the middle aged. She speaks about the, the minister. She speaks about the lay members. All of us. But notice that the truth is to be taught with a sacred dignity and a sanctified simplicity. Friends, it's, it, it, there's nothing against good learning. And that's what we're talking about here, is good learning. The school of the prophets, it was a school. But some of our schools today, friends, ruin people instead of enabling them. And we'll see a statement to that in just a minute. And they make, they make giving the truth so complex and so difficult that there's no way it can be given in sanctified simplicity by following their methods. Another statement from Acts of the Apostles, page 105 and paragraph 3. It says, Among those to whom the Savior had given the commission, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew 28, 19, were many from the humbler walks of life, men and women, who had learned to love their Lord and who had determined to follow his example of unselfish service. To these lowly ones, as well as to the disciples who had been with the Savior during his earthly ministry, had been given a precious trust. They were to carry to the world the glad tidings of salvation through Christ. And so it speaks about, again, both men and women, and that these, this group, they were to carry the glad tidings to the world. I have another uh, statement here. This is from 7T 144.2. Volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 144 in paragraph 2. And here she speaks about both men and women again. In choosing men and women for his service, God does not ask whether they possess learning or eloquence or worldly wealth. He asks, do they walk in such humility that I can teach them my way? Can I put my words into their lips? Will they represent me? So friends, more important than having money, more important than having uh, eloquence or fancy learning is to have a, a pious desire to serve God, to be studious, and to be humble so that he can teach us his ways. We can walk in his ways and he will put his words in our mouths. Going back now to Patriarchs and Prophets, the first beginning paragraph on page 593 in paragraph 1, it begins the instructors, if you have that handy. The instructors were men, not only well-versed in divine truth, but those who had themselves enjoined communion with God and had received the special endowment of his spirit. They enjoyed the respect and confidence of the people, both for the learning and piety. And so that's, that's really important that we understand that and apply that into our lives. Uh, continuing to the next paragraph. It says, In Samuel's day, 
There were two of these schools, one at Ramah, the home of the prophet, and the other at Kirjath Jerim, where the ark then was. Others were established in later times. So they just began with two schools, the whole nation. Now, we are trying to reorganize the work. We're trying to set the work on a proper basis and, and to be able to work together collectively instead of just having one or two isolated atoms here or there. We're trying to work as a unified body. And maybe, maybe we can only establish one school of the prophets right now. But friends, we can start small and we can build just like the, the Israelites did. And, and we must do this. Continuing. The pupils of these schools sustain themselves by their own labor in tilling the soil or in some mechanical employment. In Israel, this was not thought strange or degrading. Indeed, it was regarded a crime to allow children to grow up in ignorance of useful labor. Now, my father, he wasn't a Christian. He certainly wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. But he did not allow his sons to grow up ignorant of useful labor. I'll tell you that for sure. We had to learn how to labor with our hands. And we had large gardens when I was a young boy. And, uh, and I worked in those gardens, hoeing with a hoe, doing manual labor, as well as working with a tractor that we had. Uh, we learned how to do some carpentry. We learned some basic mechanics in cars and various things. And I want to tell you that in, in my position, as someone who had been about 40 years ago a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and was going to be put out of the ministry, that it was essential for me that I had to be able to support myself by doing manual labor or some kind of labor outside of preaching. And I'll expound on that more in just a minute. But going on, it says, By the command of God, every child was taught by some trade, every child was taught some trade, even though he was to be educated for holy office. Many of the religious teachers supported themselves by manual labor. Even so late as the time of the apostles, Paul and Aquila were no less honored because they earned a livelihood by their trade of tent making. And I have here just a, a little Jewish proverb. I think it comes from the Talmud, but it says, and it says, he who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. And so those people considered it was, it was an essential thing. They could work with their hands. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that when I was a minister in the Adventist church about 40 years ago, I had to come to a place where I was going to make a decision. Can I continue in this line of work and compromise myself and my experience, or do I have to step back and say, I, I'm going to lose my position? And it reminds me of a minister. I heard his testimony. I won't mention his name. Some of you might have heard of him before. But he, he shared a testimony that um, he was discovering that there were certain apostasy issues within Adventist Church and started to speak out against them. And this very much displeased his conference president, his ministerial director, and so they sit down and have a talk with him. And they asked him some questions. Now, the questions they asked him, they already knew the answers to, but they were simply asking these questions to try to, to bring to his mind the vividness of what he was approaching into. And they said, you went to the seminary, didn't you? Yes. And you probably have a lot of students' loans, maybe as much as forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of student loans. Yes. And, uh, and, and you just bought a, a house recently, didn't, didn't you? Yes. And so you may have a forty dollars or $50,000 mortgage. Uh, at that time, that was probably a reasonable mortgage. I know it would be much more today. And, and you just bought a new car, and you may have a six or $7,000 uh, bill on that that you have to pay. And by the way, you've got children. Those children are in church school. And you know that costs a lot to send children to church school. But being a minister, of course, you get a subsidy for that. It's not so expensive. So if we fire you, what are you going to do? If we have to fire you, what are you going to do? And you can, you know, the implication is all you know how to do in this world is to preach. And so you are bound up, you are, as it were, shackled with chains. And what can you do but continue to preach and compromise unless, unless you have a bedrock conviction that nothing will separate you from the love of Christ and you will suffer the loss of all things if necessary for him. And this man was willing to do that and, and, and God blessed him to be able to get out of his situation financially. But, but he left that all, you know, he left his ministry behind rather than succumbing to the, the compromising pressures. Now, the subjects in the schools of the prophets. And we're going to just look at one of these maybe for a little bit tonight and then it'll be time to close probably. But it says the chief subjects. So these weren't the only subjects, but these were the chief subjects. 
of study in these schools were the law of God with instructions given to uh, Mo- with, with the instructions given to Moses, sacred history, sacred music, and poetry. Poetry was considered so important it was one of the major subjects. And, and that's perhaps because it makes one think. You know, you just can't sit down and be a poet uh, very easily. Or the poet who didn't know it, something like that. The manner of instruction was far different from that in the theological schools of the present day, from which many students graduate with less real knowledge of God and religious truth than when they entered. And you say, how can that be? They go to these schools, they're, they're learning, they're taking all these theology, Old Testament, New Testament, Bible history, semantics, and all those things they study. Well, when I was getting into trouble several years ago, I wanted to discuss some of the issues that I was having great concerns about with my conference president. And I offered, I said, let's sit down and let's just open up the Bible, you and me, and let's take a Bible only and let's just look at these theological issues that I have concerns about. And he just said, well, Alan, I couldn't study with you. I'm no theologian. Now, you need to understand, I've never been to an Adventist school as a student. I never spent one day in academy. I never spent one day at Columbia Union College or Bering Springs, Andrews University, or any of our schools. Not one single day. I got my understanding from the Bible through diligent study and my experience through canvassing work and doing practical, hands-on work. My conference president, on the other hand, he had a Master's of Divinity from Bering Springs, from Andrews University. And it, you know, this statement reminds me of that very situation. Because later as we were discussing things, he said, you know, your problem is you've never been to the school. And if you could just go to Andrews University, you would meet people like you who have concerns just like you do. And you could talk about them with these other people who have worked their way through these concerns, you know, and it would help you. And I looked at my conference president, I said, Elder B, I, I said, it would ruin me just like it ruined you where I couldn't give a Bible study to someone. I couldn't study the Bible to someone. That's not what I want. What we want, friends, what we need are men and women who have a true religious experience. And they need to be instructed thoroughly in the law of God. They need to be instructed in in the teachings of Moses or the Torah. They need to understand sacred history. And sacred history does not include evolution, by the way. They need to know sacred music and poetry so that they will be more knowledgeable of God and of religious truth after they have training. But considering these points, notice it goes on on page uh, 593 in paragraph 4. In those schools of the olden time, it was the grand object of all study to learn the will of God and man's duty toward him. In the records of sacred history were traced the footsteps of Jehovah, The great truths set forth by the types were brought to view, and faith grasped the central object of all that system. What is that central object? The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Continuing. A spirit of devotion was cherished. Not only were students taught the duty of prayer, but they were taught how to pray, how to approach their Creator, how to exercise faith in him, and how to understand and obey the teachings of his spirit. Sanctified intellects brought forth from the treasure house of God things new and old, and the spirit of God was manifested in prophecy and sacred song. So they were not only taught the duty of prayer, but they were taught how to pray. And you remember the the disciples came to Jesus one day and they said, teach us how to pray. And he gave what we call the Lord's Prayer. And friends, if you want to learn how to pray in the simplest way, get the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing by Ellen White and read the section that deals with the Lord's Prayer where she takes it line by line and and expounds on it. And there you will understand not only the duty of prayer, but you will learn how to pray. I, I promise you it will make a difference. Continuing, music. And we'll finish with just a little bit on music here tonight. Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble, and elevating, 
and to awaken in the soul devotion and gratitude to God. What a contrast between the ancient custom, that ancient custom that she says, which was pure, noble, and elevating, what a contrast between the ancient custom and the uses to which music is now too often devoted. How many employ this gift to exalt self instead of using it to glorify God? A love for music leads the unwary to unite with world lovers in pleasure gatherings where God has forbidden his children to go. So think about that, friends. Music today, it, 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 it consumes our world. It consumes our country, at least in America. You can't go into Walmart without listening to music. You can't go into any restaurant without listening to music. You can't go almost any place in public without listening to music. I got a pair of these Bose uh, QC35s or whatever they call them. They're noise-canceling headphones. And I'll wear those a lot of times. If I go into Walmart in those places, I have a gymnasium. I work out in town some. And they, like all these other places, they play music. Now, I'm not like my good brother Alan here can just take my hearing aid out. <laughs> and he doesn't have to hear it. But, but... But my ears are still working well enough I can hear it. But I put, put the noise-canceling headphones on, and then I turn on a Bible, uh, a Bible program or Spirit of Prophecy where it's being read, and, and I don't have to listen to the music. But music is just destroying people today. It is uh, something that glorifies a man. And we see this in the churches even. It's just not out in the Walmarts and the restaurants, but you go to the churches, and there they have the... Um, the electric guitars, the bass guitars, the drum sets on the platforms. And the music there is not heavenly music at all. Not at all. Now, it says in, in the next paragraph, 594.2, Thus that which is a great blessing, when rightly used, becomes one of the most successful agencies by which Satan allures the mind from duty and from the contemplation of eternal things. And music is, when rightly used, a great blessing, but it can destroy us when not. And in the next paragraph, it says, Music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above. And we should endeavor, in our songs of praise, to approach as nearly as possible the harmony of the heavenly choirs. The proper training of the voice is an important feature in education and should not be neglected. Singing as a part of religious service is as much an act of worship as is prayer. The heart must fill the spirit of the song to give it right expression. And man, there's a, a chunk full in just that paragraph. A chunk full. But, you know, Jesus said that when we pray, we should say that thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? Well, one thing we, we read about here is that music forms a part of the worship of the course above. And not only does music form part, but a special kind of music, a music that is pure, noble, elevating, and refined. And we should make our music as nearly possible like the heavenly choirs. Now, I downloaded some music yesterday, and, and uh, I was thinking of playing it, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I can't play this for y'all. But I was going to play some samples of supposed Christian music for you. But I think that you probably already know what these things would be. They are jitterbugging, uh, rock and roll, and, and those kind of things that we see in, in, in the, what, the, what they call go, uh, gospel rock and in what they call southern gospel music. Uh, these things are not heavenly of origin. Now, she speaks about the proper training of the voice. And those of you who have known me for a long time know that I do not sing well. And I know that I do not sing well. I love to sing, but I know I don't sing well. However, however, I used to sing a lot worse. I used to sing terrible. I, I, sing, I, I would sing and people would, would, would put their hands over their ears and say, Brother Allen, please spare us. You know, don't do this to us. Be nice to us. I thought you loved us. Um, but I learned something from someone who, who was a good singer. And, and I was asking this person, I said, how can I become a better singer? And they said, sing. Sing, sing, sing. Sing in the shower. Sing when you're working. Sing when you're traveling. The more you sing, the better you'll be able to sing. And I found that to be true. Now, again, I'm not saying I, I, I sing well tonight. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying I do sing better than I did 20 years ago or 30 years ago for a long way. And notice it says that singing is a part of the religious service as much as the worship as much of an act of worship as is prayer. If we were going to have the whole congregation come together and we we're going to have a prayer, 
Maybe someone's leading out in that prayer, or two or three people are going to take turns praying. But every head will be bowed, right? Every eye is closed. Whether we can kneel or just have to bow, we're all going to participate in that prayer, right? But singing, listen to me carefully, singing is as much an act of worship as is prayer. Therefore, when we have congregational singing, we should all be singing just as if we were all praying together. Now, that doesn't mean you have to sing loud. It doesn't mean that we expect you to sing pretty. But we expect you to sing. I'd say, when I say we, I should say, God expects you to. I believe heaven expects you to. He wants you to. And, you know, it's like our children when they first are learning to walk. They don't have to walk perfect. They don't have to run perfect. They just get up and fall over, and we're just there cheering them on. We're glad for it, right? God's glad when you just try, because it's an act of worship. And it says that the heart must fill the spirit of the song. That tells me that there's different spirits with which a particular song can be sung. And we can sing it with the wrong spirit. We can sing it with the wrong kind of music and the wrong kind of tempo and not understand the spirit and give it the right impression instead we'll give it a wrong impression. The idea that music is amoral is wrong. What do I mean when I say amoral? This, this word means has no moral qualities. But friends, music, taken even separated totally from the words, it has moral qualities. Okay? Music has moral qualities. And it can have good moral qualities or it can have bad moral qualities. And there's no way that we can give a song the right expression if we had the wrong kind of music. And I just want to close tonight with this uh, text from Ezekiel chapter 28. You know, Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 12, he says, Son of man, take up a, a, a lamentation against the, the, the king of Tyrus, right? But notice, we, but we know that this is speaking really of Satan under the symbol of the king of Tyrus. And in verse 13, Ezekiel 28, 13, he says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardas, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes. Now get this was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. What this tells me is that Lucifer didn't need tabrets. He didn't need pipes to produce these, if you please, musical notes or these sounds. It was prepared within him. Somehow he had within himself the ability to produce musical notes. He was the leader of the heavenly choir. And we know that Lucifer understands music far better than any human being on this earth. And he knows how to manipulate music and use it as a snare against Christians. But friends, we have someone who understands music more than Lucifer because he created the music in Lucifer, and that's Jesus Christ. And if we will follow the counsels that God has given to us, that Christ has given to his church, we can have pure, elevated, noble singing and music in our midst. Now, we're going to continue this study next week. Our time is, is really far past where we should be right now. But we're going to continue this study next week. Now, right now, I've just opened up the, um, the or I've unlocked the download button. So there's a download arrow. If you want to download these slides, you'll have them for the next week or week and after. And, and you'll see also the extra comments I've made. You'll see the things that I've highlighted throughout this whole chapter. And so we're going to be coming back, picking up here, um, reviewing just a, a few minutes, and then we'll pick up and, and go to slide 28 next week, uh, where we continue in Patriarchs and Prophets. But we're using this, again, as a foundation for a series on uh, learning how to be light bearers, learning how to share and witness, understanding what our true education in Christ must be, that we need to be able to pass on that truth to others. And so, until the next session, may God bless you lots and lots.